I'm Henrik. I'm the CEO of Purdue, which is a goal management platform focused on strategy execution. Um, and I'm here with Nick Stanford today to talk Hi. about how to get strategy out of the boardroom. Nick, can you start by can you start first by telling us a bit about yourself and your journey, uh, your experience with strategy and your journey with OKR? Certainly, yeah. Thanks for having me along today, Henrik. It really appreciated. And uh, yeah, my name's Nick Stanforth. I'm a founder of a company called Progress Factors. Our purpose is to help people love their job. We don't do that, however, by just having group hugs and great uh, events at the end of the year where everyone parties and has a really great night. The way we help people to love the job is by helping them to re-engage with the reason they applied for that job in the first place. We want everyone to kind of reconnect with the reason why they wanted to work at that company, the reason why they really wanted that job when they applied for the job. And that's kind of how OKR is the connection between what we do and what, uh, how we help our customers. Thanks. Can you, uh, strategy is, is, is a broad term. Okay, can you explain how you would define strategy? Yeah, sure. I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of the, the Porter description of strategy is about deciding what not to do. Um, but to maybe take more than the one sentence answer, I think strategy is about thoroughly understanding where you are in detail, then also knowing uh, what's going on around you. And finally, you can then set your desired uh, destination. And I think a lot of people get that the wrong way around. They just fix on the destination. But if you think about a GPS, like a TomTom or a Garmin, when you stick it on the window, you're not going to start driving until it knows where you are. And you're certainly not going to set off until you start looking around and checking your mirrors. And that's what strategy is about, so that you can find the easiest way to get to your destination. And that's where Porter comes in again to do as few things as possible to get further ahead than you expected you could do. That's Michael T. Porter, I'm thinking that you're referring to. Uh, that's and right, exactly, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's let's include a link to uh, that definition of strategy from Porter in the in the video description. Okay. Um, so when we talk about getting strategy out of the boardroom, so you just define what strategy is. Mm -hmm. um, what do you mean by saying how to get strategy out of the out of the, out of the boardroom? Well, I, th I think we we'll probably have to look back over the kind of the last fifty years because we'd like to think that strategy, as we know it in a lot of traditional companies today, is what strategy always was. That's a very top-down process. But if you think there was like a communication revolution in the 80s, and this is when you know, things like fax machines were being invented, when telephone lines started getting less expensive. And this was the point where the central office's headquarters got a lot more control over things. So an uncle of mine, he used to be responsible for um, uh, the, the regional country companies of a very large car manufacturer, a well-known German car manufacturer. When he was working and heading up South Africa or later, that company in the UK, he had a lot of autonomy. And of course, the people in the central offices in Germany, they had their missions and they had their visions, but it wasn't about this whole command and control. He was the man that was out in the region and he was the guy that was actually having to think. And in a similar way, before we invented car phones and later, of course, proper cell phones and phones we carry around in our pocket, then the sales guy that was out for a week driving from one customer to the next had to think about his own pitch. And I believe that things have gone wrong as the communication revolution came along. We've got a lot more chances and opportunities to speak to each other. And I'm the last person who says we need to get rid of iPhones or, or Samsungs or whatever you, you carry in your pocket. But it shouldn't be something that's used to check on people to make sure that they think the same way as we do. And that's why I love OKR because it takes the strategy back out of the boardroom and gives it back to the people. And that's where we were at in the 60s and the 70s. And I think it's slowly gone further and further away from that up until probably the last 10 years when people started implementing OKR. Okay. Okay. But before we dive into the, the topic, how OKR can help you get strategy out of the boardroom, mm -hmm. why, is it that in, that, why is it that still today in so many companies, strategy stays inside the boardroom? It's just something that's discussed amongst the executive team. It's a good question. Uh, I have lots of answers to this in our workshops and uh, working with the team I work with, they all come along with lots of experience from different operational careers before they came consultants. And so what we like to basically say is, imagine that you were betting on the lottery every Saturday or whatever day it is in your country. And every week you bought a lottery ticket with exactly the same six numbers. 
Now, it could be that for 20 years you've been doing this and every week you don't get a single number. You've never won a thing, not even 10 euros, dollars or pounds or whatever your currency is. Would you stop betting? Probably not. Even though you've worked out that a process isn't working and isn't being beneficial, you're not going to stop. And the reason is because you're scared. You're petrified that if you stop buying those six numbers next week, somebody's going to become a millionaire with your six numbers. And so this is the same thing about getting strategy out of the boardroom. And I believe that delegation is directly related to trust and risk. If you can trust your staff and if you can manage the risk, then you can delegate. If you can't trust your staff, you can't delegate. And so especially in a company that's maybe starting to see a downturn where the market's changing, they need to start thinking about how they can also change the way they work. But it's counterintuitive to let go when things are going wrong. And that's why I believe a lot of boards who've grown up as well in this control environment, who've learned from their own managers about mission statements and critical success factors that are for the whole company, I think they get scared because they see the risk that if they do things differently, the numbers are going to come up next week and the company is going to have a detrimental effect through that. But, but, you're, ex but you're also saying that if they don't get strategy out of the boardroom, that that will have a detrimental effect on the performance of the company. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I don't, I don't play on the lottery. I say I win every week because, you know, I don't pay every week. But, yeah. you know, if I imagine that I was win playing the lottery every week and then I stopped next week, even if my numbers came up, I wouldn't have lost anything. The difference yeah. is when it's a company and you need to move with the times and you need to work with the kind of generations of people that work with us today they're not going to put up with the old school style of management, which I grew up with in the 80s and the 90s. They're not interested in people who say you have to be in the office at eight in the morning and you will clock out at five in the evening. And so there's a, a much larger risk that the company is going to fail if they don't manage the risk of letting go slightly and getting that strategy out to the people so they can actually help things move along, just like my uncle did in the car industry back in the 80s. So, so if, I, if I understand you correctly... Yeah. Um, in the old days, that there, there wasn't really a clear need for to get strategy out of the boardroom, which is why it why it was like that in the first place. Yeah, I think it was. And now people are opposing group. change. So yeah. even though there is now a clear need to get strategy out of the boardroom, there is no, no one is is daring to do that to make that step. Do I interpret that correctly? I wouldn't say that no one's doing it. I think if you look at some of the most successful companies of our time, then there's a lot of people doing that. But what I would say is the powerhouses of the last century. You know, if you think who were the big names, at the, the year 99, as we came to the year 2000, those big names aren't that big anymore. Certainly they're not the kind of names that we're talking about all the time. Some of them are still working on back ends and they've still got a profitable business. But sure. if you really think about it, where are, where are the good minds going these days? These are the kind of countries, uh, companies that have distributed strategy throughout the organization. And just to kind of clarify what I said earlier on, my pitch is that before the 80s, that kind of thinking was distributed anyway because we didn't have iPhones or fax machines and telephone calls were expensive. So people had to think for themselves. And it's great we can communicate better, but it shouldn't be that communicating better means that all the managers in that small room tell thousands of people what to think. Okay. Okay. Um, so yeah, let's, let's take the step towards OKR and, and let's see how OKR can help solve this problem. Mm -hmm. um, so in, in your view, like, um, what role can OKR play in helping to get strategy out of the boardroom and, and make it into something that the entire organization uh, engages with okay so i mean the first thing is what we don't want to do is let go completely so i i just written a book called win with okr and there's a lot of, of mindset involved in that because the methodology okr is pretty easy uh, but actually applying okr in the right way is a challenge um, one of the things we need to talk about for instance is how much bosses should let go now there's lots of different business models about hierarchies and who's a manager, who's a leader and who's a domain. And there's lots of different words around, but at the end of the day, some people are going to have to make some decisions. You won't be able to distribute everything throughout your company. And OKR firstly helps in that transition journey because what it means is we're not completely letting go of everything. What I like to say is management with OKR is like riding a mountain bike down a hill. 
I don't know if you ride a mountain bike, Henrik, but if you want to go down a hill on a mountain quickly, I'm not that fit anymore, but I used to do a lot of this. And you have to slightly let go. You have to let the thing move. It's the same when you're skiing. You have to let your skis move with the mountain. But if you let the mountain ski you, it's going to hurt. And if you let the mountain ride your bike, you're going to fall off. So you can't just let go completely. Yeah. That's how OKR helps managers to let go just enough. It helps managers to distribute this kind of decision-making process. But because we're checking in every week and because we're reviewing things every quarter, it can't go that wrong. And of course, the people who get all this free power and, wow, I'm supposed to make a decision now, if they do that uh, and they start making decisions that are a little bit too selfish and they haven't learned how to collaborate with other areas yet, then it's also an early warning system. And that's the first step in the transition journey. I don't want to talk too long. There's, there's more steps that come after that, but you need to tell me whether the answer is too long or too short for you, Henry. No, I, I, I love the analogy, by the way, of the, uh, of the, of the mountain bike. Uh, I think that's really helpful to understand the, the concept. Although I, um, I, I do think that, um, that the way you describe OKRs right now and how OKRs can help mm -hmm. are based on a certain, a certain way of working with OKRs. Mm -hmm. um, so you're talking about like giving away control, um, uh, giving people more autonomy uh, like it used to be before, uh, mm -hmm. these, these kind of things. So maybe it makes sense to zoom in on that a little bit more. So how would you, for example, the simple process of, of, of setting an OKR for yourself, for your team or inside your organization, like how yeah. would you recommend organizations approach that in order to achieve the, uh, in order to, to help them get strategy out of the boardroom. Yeah, and, and, and this was one of, the, one of the easiest and at the same time the hardest chapters to write in my book because this is the bit where you have to really get it right. Uh, OKR is a garbage in, garbage out instrument. And that's why I'm saying at the start of your transition journey, OKR is good to make sure you don't get things too wrong. You know, you don't set goals for five years, you set goals for three months. And you've got to get this right. And it's a brilliant question. And what we always do is we try to keep things simple and we ask customers, we just say to them in workshops, what would you dream of achieving? And I had a really, really interesting experience when I was teaching OKR, a large company, and we moved from one area to the next before we got people to work together over the divisions. And in the finance area, we worked with a team once and there was three different kind of departments within that team that we trained. And, um, you know, one part was looking after the treasury. So it was about how to make much more money out of a lot of money. And so they had some real moonshot goals. At the same time in that team, there were some people and they wrote the yearly reports because it was a limited company, you know, a shareholder company. And they had the yearly and the quarterly reports. And so their dreams were a lot more about getting the report out on time without there being any mistakes in there. And so this is why we like to use the word dream because it's a very personal thing. And I think OKR is about driving your organization forward but if we do distribute the strategy out of the boardroom, we have to let people describe their goals in a fashion that actually motivates them. And I think that's one of the big powers of OKR is you don't have to write boring goals down. You have to write goals down that you believe in and that you would actually want to achieve. Just the same as when you think about bringing your children up, you dream of them becoming a certain person. And it's the same again with OKR. We want people to grow with the organization and dream of the next level in their organization. So, so you are recommending that um, the people below the leadership level um, do create their OKRs themselves? Definitely. I mean, yeah. you've got a top-down, bottom-up, as, as OKR consultants like to talk about it. I prefer to think about left and right. And I had a, a customer called Simon Walter, and he came up with this. Simon Walter's a great guy. And he said, it's not up and down, it's left and right. You know, management and employees is no longer the hierarchy tree. And... What we do need to say, though, is everyone needs to look within their own area. And, uh, and uh, it's like a diagram that was really hard to, to do in the book. And the diagram is like lots of stones falling on water. And so the company OKRs, they're like the big stones and they have the big waves that affect everyone. And then if you do individual OKRs, it's like a small pebble hitting the water. And it won't have quite such a spread. But sometimes there might be one individual or one tribe or one team that's working on something that really does affect the whole organization. And so that might be a larger stone again. And these ripples, they need to work with each other to amplify each other and not cancel each other out. I study physics and I know that analogy doesn't <laughs> work, <laughs> but let's, let's just keep it as saying we want the OKRs to support each other. And that's where the whole alignment comes in. So yeah, the so, managers, 
the leaders need to set a direction, but everyone else needs to think about how they interpret that. Okay, so, so, you, so you do recommend that the, uh, the people below the managers do create their own OKRs, yeah. but they need to be aligned with the higher level OKRs of the organization. And the left and the right, and we need to as well, maybe not in the first OKR cycle, but later on, we need to make sure that departments are breaking down silos with OKRs. Because the nice thing about OKR is you can, uh, you can basically work together with other departments without having to rewrite all your employment um, contracts and think about a reorganization structure. It's yeah. just about what do we dream of achieving? Who needs to work on that project? So definitely, absolutely. And, and how, how would you recommend teams to make sure that also the alignment with other teams, uh, so the left and right that you refer to, yeah. Is, is there any tips that you can give them to help them achieve that and break through these silos other than making all the OKRs that you set for yourself that the organization is working on transparent? Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think the first thing is to really is just get started. You know, don't be afraid of getting it wrong. You know, um, it's, it's I'd rather be approximately right than exactly wrong. It's a phrase I once heard many years ago in a management training. And and so just get started. And, and one of the first OKR projects that I worked with with the larger organizations quite a few years back now, we actually found out that there were three departments working on the same thing. It was something to do with e-learning, you know, like blended learning platforms, long before other people were talking about them, really. And it turned out that the people I was working with, um, the purchasing department and the HR department were all three working with different organizations um, to, to look into e-learning. And so yeah. through OKR, we found that out, but you're not going to, you're not necessarily going to get it all right in the first quarter or the second quarter, but you'll slowly get it better and better and better. And so it's an iterative process. You need a bit of practice and OKR will get more and more into your organization and help you more and more as you go along. Okay. <laughs> that makes sense and, to you. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. The, um, so we, we touched a bit on, on, on as setting OKRs, which is, of course, a very big and important component of an OKR program. And you yeah. need to do that in a certain way in order to, uh, to really help that, get that strategy out of the boardroom. Yeah. Are there any other tips or best practices that you can share with our audience to, uh, to approach OKR in a certain way or in order to, to further achieve that, to further get that strategy out of the boardroom? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Because I mean, if you don't do that, we have to say that the danger is you're going to create something which I call a bottleneck of growth. And so people in production projects, they love to speak about bottlenecks, you know, where does the production get stuck? It's the same again, if you're in a software development company like yours, it could be that testing is the bottleneck, bottleneck in, your, in your sprint process, you know, and if testing is taking too long, you've got to work on that bottleneck so you can test quicker and, and be more agile. And the bottleneck of growth is where a few people are making decisions for everyone else. They won't recognize themselves as a bottleneck of growth. And so that's the first thing is the board has to realize that if they're busy, then they're not doing the job well. And I love to tell managers that some of us work well and the others work longer. Because the <laughs> irony is, <laughs> right? the irony is, I'm sorry if it's my computer that's beeping the whole time. I thought I'd switched all that stuff off. But the, the problem is, um, if you feel as a manager that you're doing a good job, it's probably because you're doing a good job. Managers are there to delegate. And in German, there's a wonderful phrase where they say, machen lassen, nicht machen bremsen. In other words, let people do things. Don't slow them down. And this is what we need to do is we need to let people do things. And so when it comes to the actual crafting process, you'll find that some people think in key results and others will think in objectives. We'll always start by saying, what's your dream? What's the big picture? But I'm a dreamy big picture kind of guy. That's why I'm a consultant. Sure. Yeah. Other people, they'll think in key results, very measurable things. They come more from the task area. So you've got to make sure you don't get tasks mixed up with key results. If people say we rang 100 customers, we'll say that's a task. If they say we won 100 new customers, that's an achievement. And that's a big difference. So avoid the task and, and goal. Um, uh, yeah, problem, <laughs> the mistake yeah. of thinking that a task is a goal. But if people are talking in key results all the time, don't say, oh, this English guy I saw on the web the other day, he said we have to start with the goal. You, you can think about the dream after you've started collecting your key results. Other people, they might be like me, a bit more blue sky thinkers, and they'll think about the dream, and then they say, how can we make that happen? And that's really what OKR is all about. It's about asking the question how, not if something is possible, right? Cool. Um, 
I guess that's all for this uh, for this interview today, Nick. So thanks a lot for your time and thanks a lot for sharing uh, all your knowledge and experience with our audience. And I think the whole topic regarding uh, tasks, outputs versus real results and, and outcomes, I think that's a great topic for a next interview. Henrik, I really, really appreciate this opportunity and I really want to thank all the team at Purdue. You're a fantastic team with a great product and it's, uh, it's been great working with you for the last few years and to see that you're trying to push through the pioneer of, of OKR. And that's what we need to do here is keep pushing it to the next level. So great to work with you and thanks for the opportunity. Thanks, Nick. Have a great rest of your day. Ciao. At Purdue, our commitment has always been to help organizations grow faster and become successful with OKR, which is why we offer our content for free. We've decided to go one step further and make our software free as well. Our free plan includes all core functionality and allows you to track an unlimited number of goals. Head over to purdue.com to set up your own free Purdue account.